Okay, hello. Um, hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, I am, my name's Holly Smith. I'm a member of the Icon Book and Paper Group Events and Training Committee and I've been working with Ashley to get this um, webinar um, started. And I just wanted to welcome you all and thank you for um, joining us uh, for this, the first in this webinar series looking at private practice in conservation. I'm just gonna do a quick introduction um, of Ashley and then we can get started. So before becoming a conservator, Ashley Brown worked as a PA and art collection manager, which gave her a significant insight into business management within the art world. And then after completing her training at Camberwell, she took up a role as head of conservation at John Jones, which was a private framing and conservation practice based in London. Um, at the moment, she's currently on contract at the Warburg Institute working uh, on a photographic archive conservation project. And all of this puts her in a really good position to give us some insight into business management um, within conservation private practice. So without any further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Ashley and, um, and we can begin. I will also to say that I think we'll be able to take some questions at the end, but she's going to give us a presentation to start with. So if you could bear that in mind. Okay, here we go. Yes. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley Brown. Thank you so much, Holly, for that introduction. Um, I'll go ahead and say we are beginning the seminar. Um, so this is a, sem a webinar, seminar, <laughs> answering some questions that have already been handed in to us, as well as some tidbits that I think would be really important for everyone to know um, about private practice and kind of business development and management. Um, so I, in this whole session, we're really just going to address some of the topics that were kind of outlined in the ad, as well as some questions that people have given to us. Um, and again, those little tidbits that I think would be really important for people to know as we start. Um, we'll have questions at the end as well, open to all of you, and then, We'll also at one point have a poll to ask if you've enjoyed this session, if there's anything else that you'd like to hear in the next session, if we should have a next session and what the topic should be on. So without further ado, um, yeah, there's the poll. So without further ado, we'll go ahead into the next step, which is, oh, there we go, a disclaimer. <laughs> the first thing that we're gonna talk about is just, to say that everything that we talk about in this uh, webinar is going to be, you know, it's collated from a number of different publicly available websites, um, the gov.uk site, a uh, lot of different other um, websites that are, that advise legal information um, that are available to everyone. So, oh yes, and I just realized I don't have my video on, so let me turn that on for you. Hello everyone. So yes, uh, I'm Ashley. And we'll be having, um, we can have a face-to-face -face kind of chat like this as well. Um, so yes, so the disclaimer is basically saying that uh, the views are not expressly held by ICON or the book and paper group. Um, and at times, or myself, this is again, just collated information that I've put together for you all to take advantage of. Um, and there's a list of references at the end, which I think are really useful websites and, and um, links that should help you through all these different slides that we'll be talking about. <clears throat> so session one, um, we will be, and if you don't mind actually, I'm just having a small issue here. There we go. All right, so session one will be about li liability and insurance. Um, a, secondly, a brief clarification of what terms and conditions are, what they mean, how we use them, do we need them. Uh, the next session is going to, the next question is contracts and uh, release forms and invoicing. And then there's producing documentation. There's a final session, or well, it's final two sections on GDPR. What is it? Do we need it? And why? And finally, the pricing and uh, how to expense your business costs and things. So, and again, these are all brief overviews that we'll be talking about. You know, each of these topics are questions that have been brought to brought forward to us throughout this whole you know, question and answer um, request that we've given. Uh, so let's start 
with liability and insurance. And I'm just going to be having a slight issue at the moment. If you just give me one session, second. I'm going to, oh, there we go. Just need to move the pole, essentially. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, I don't have the ability to do that. So if you just give me one sec second. Right, I'm back to play. Oof, sorry about this, guys. Right, so let's start with liability and insurance. Terms to know. I'm not going to be going into all of the outlines of what you need to have in your insurance, but just kind of highlighting the pitfalls that, you know, can be nipped in the bud very simply early on by talking with your insurer. And you'll see that at the bottom of this slide. Talk to your insurer. They're nice people. They can def they should be nice people, I hope. They should be able to explain things in you know, full for you. But this is just to kind of get you in the know of what exactly is you know, being said in your insurance policy. So the first thing we have up there is professional indemnity. And in the US, and I believe in uh, Canada, it's known as errors and omissions. Um, so I have some little oops, kind of splash there, because it implies any issue that may arise due to negligence. So this would be, a good example of this would be you spilled your coffee on something or, or um, you labeled something incorrectly and dissociation occurred. So professional indemnity is very important to have because it also straddles the line into public liability and contents liability. It is Anytime you may make a mistake that is considered negligence, that's one thing. But within conservation, there's a lot of gray lines. There are lots of people who may say, oh, that was negligence, but actually say, well, no, I, I, this isn't negligent. This is something that is a natural uh, occurrence that can happen in this treatment. This is something that you know I, I should not be liable for because I followed the rules. I did everything right as accordance to my education and my professional knowledge from experience. But professional indemnity within conservation generally means anything of negligence and then that kind of fine line. So that's a very important fine line for a lot of us because not many people understand what is implied when you have um, a conservation treatment ex executed. So this is particularly important to know and to make sure that your insurance has. This also means that if you are operating your studio in your home or you have business insurance or home insurance that you think covers your professional practice, wherever that may be, you really do need to check because most business insurances for an, you know, a premises and home insurance don't cover professional indemnity because that's not part of the scope. You can obviously tailor your insurance policy, but that's something that you need to talk about with your insurer. So please do make sure you speak with your insurer at length about that, that one little topic. Um, the next section down is crime, public liability, and contents cover. Obviously crime, you never know what could happen. Somebody can break into your studio. Um, public liability is accidentals. So particularly it means if anybody is harmed on site where you may be hosting your practice. Um, but it also can sometimes extend into items. So as in the public's items that are in your care. Uh, again, that straddles a line into the professional indemnity section as well as other uh, kind of topics within your insurance as far as covering you from any damage to clients' objects. But public liability is definitely something that's important to have and is usually pretty standard. And then finally, contents cover. Contents cover covers all the contents within your premises that are yours. Now, for that to extend into items that belong to other clients, that's something you need to talk about with your insurer. The contents cover is actually really important for conservators because we have a lot of stuff. You probably realize that you, you know, if you've ever had to move studio, that you have, at least myself from a paper conservation point of view, there's blotting paper, there's different Japanese tissues, there's chemicals, lots of chemicals. And uh, with the concept of blotting paper, let's say you've just bought a whole new stack of blotting papers and then you had a leak 
and th that's a significant cost. So with that in mind, contents cover is something that you can actually go back to your insurer and say, there was a leak in my studio, I lost all this material, I would like to be reimbursed for it because it's vital to my business. So contents cover is really key. But that section of crime, public liability, contents cover, all of that does generally come standard with business, general business insurance and home insurance. Um, but the professional indemnity is pretty specific to having insurance that covers a professional, um, well, your, your profession, your, your, your business. Um, and finally, at the bottom, I have my little two thumbs saying yay, because uh, that is something that I didn't realize can be in kind of conservation insurance, but it's pretty common in most um, art conservators or archive conservators insurance policies is the extension of that insurance policy to contractors and for on-site work. Um, I've seen a few different policies where they actually reduce the cost if you do most of your work on site, because obviously that is reducing the chances of issues due to logistics or due to packaging or transport, all of those things where we as professionals know there can be tons of issues that arise out of that. If you work on site, that's less liable to happen because you are generally either under the supervision or the object itself or you know, the archival material is in the possession of the client technically at all times. So that can be a bit of a benefit within your insurance. And as far as the extension to contractors, I've found that as long as the contractors are of a similar or equivalent uh, kind of professional qualification, either by experience, or you know, educational qualifications as yourself, that should extend to that contractor. Now, again, this is not with every single you know, policy. This is something that definitely should be discussed with your insurer and should be um, kind of discussed at length before signing up to a policy. But make sure that you kind of have these terms and these concepts in mind to ask them because it could reduce your, your policy premium and it can save you a lot in the long term as well, as long as you're making sure that you're trying to cover as many bases as possible. And at the bottom where it says, talk to your insurer, um, this is a really key thing because throughout your time working with that insurer, having a policy with that insurer, you really do need to talk with them often, particularly if you have a studio or, well, if you have a studio or you're accepting items into your possession by the client, that are a significant cost because your insurance extends to a certain liability coverage. So you have a limit. Uh, generally, conservators insurances start at about 50, no, sorry, not 50, 500,000 pounds of combined item cost. So, you know, if let's say you happen to have 500,000 pounds worth of objects in your studio, and somebody brings that extra thing that adds another 10 pounds to it and something happens in your studio, you're technically no longer covered. Your insurer will say, whoa, whoa, whoa. The combined cost of everything that it belongs to clients in your studio is no longer what we can cover. And you didn't tell us that you wanted to extend your, you know, your limit. And if you don't have that conversation with them regularly, whenever you have these kinds of situations arise, it, it can cause significant issue at the worst time. I mean, you know how bad luck is. It's one of those, it's sod's luck. You have that moment and suddenly it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're out of luck, you're, you are liable and your insurance can't help you in this situation. And so it's really important to memorize what that limit is. I know what my limit is on the back of my hand. And I know that, you know, if I tally up all of the items in my studio, it's not going to you know, reach that limit. So that's liability and insurance. Um, we can obviously talk more at length about that in a little bit, but for now, uh, let's move on. So terms and conditions. I've decided to separate this out into three sections. Firstly, terms and conditions, what are they? It is an outline of your business's practices and the requirements for your services. It should include a clear outline of the services you provide, your basic terms of liability, any governing laws that guide your practice, and payment terms. Now, what does all that mean? 
It means that this is essentially a guide for the public to understand what you do. Every time people say, what's the conservator? What is that? What does that even mean? Your terms and conditions, aside from your website or, or your own verbal description, outlines on a professional level what you and your business can do for the client. So the clear outline of services is vital. If you are a painting conservator, you need to outline what paintings means, like what that, what that covers. Does that mean paintings on paper? Maybe not. Does that mean paintings on canvas? Probably. So that's one of those things that you have to outline in your terms and conditions so that you don't have somebody who says, well, oh, you know, clients turning around and saying, but you said you could do this. And it's like, well, no, actually my outline says a painting conservator in my business does this, a conservator in my business does this, um, a treatment means this, uh, an assessment means this, et cetera, et cetera. It's really defining that for your client as well as the services, because that in itself is really key to be clear about. Obviously, you know, Terms and conditions are not what you give to a client before you even talk with them. So be ready to talk with them about these things. But if it ever, you know, you find that one litigious client and they're really, really particular, that's when you can discuss with them. Well, if you look at my terms and conditions, it's, it's clear as day. Next is your basic terms of liability. Not asking you to put your full outline of your insurance policy in there, but certainly to say, you know, I'm not liable for logistics, for example, because, you know, the client getting an Addison Lee to ship something over to you from across town and that Addison Lee gets in a car accident and the client goes, well, it was going to you and the accident was closer to you than to me. No, yeah, that's where you can say, I'm not liable for that. Um, you really need to go through with your insurer to say, what are the things I am really liable for? Um, but there are general things that are pretty clear that you can say, I'm not liable for that. I'm not liable for, you know, once you can even say it's like once it's in your hands, in your possession, even if you're in my studio and trip down the stairs, that's yours. God forbid that ever happens, of course. But, or like, you know, you, the, the clients build their coffee on your, on their artwork in your studio. You're not liable for that. And that's something that you can kind of go through your terms and conditions and discuss that, you know, with a lawyer or, you know, look at examples and try and put that in. And we'll get to that lawyer subject in just a moment. Any governing laws that guide your practice is more, it's not really applicable for us, but I do like to say that, I mean, at least in my own private practice, I do mention that I try, you know, within a reasonable amount of skill and, and consciousness to abide by PD 5454, which is the standards of practice set in the UK for the preservation of archival materials. So that's something where I've included that so that the client, if they are very, very, very particular and then want to look it up, they can say, what's PD 5454? What law is this? So they can say, oh, it's an ISO and this is what it outlines, et cetera. And it can sometimes also really help condense your terms and conditions so you don't, you know, have to extend it to explain what those laws are without just saying this is a, a legal term or an ISO or something that's publicly available and public knowledge that you can go and look up independently and realize what that means in terms of my business. And finally, I put it in stars, I put it in bold, and I put it in italics, payment terms. Payment terms are so important. It's mainly the reason why I think you should have terms and conditions. Terms and conditions are there to protect you and to make sure you get paid. Payment terms are not limited to terms and conditions, but I think that's the best place to start putting them because then it's there in black and white. A uh, perfect example of payment terms is 30 day practice, you know, 30, 30 day service. So if I've completed a service, I've invoiced you, I expect payment in 30 days or else that can be included in your terms and conditions. And that really does, it really does clarify things. You know, a client can't come back and say, you didn't say that. And it's like, well, it's there. So it's there in writing. Um, before we go any further, pro tip, try to avoid warranties and guarantees, even verbally. Never, I mean, I'm sure many of you have been in private practice for a while and understand that, and, and even in public sector, do not promise what is unachievable or you don't know can be achievable. Um, I would never sit and promise that I can do something 
without saying, but these are the issues that might arise. And I certainly would never promise anything in writing in this kind of sense, like in my terms and conditions. Instead, what you should do is provide accurate and useful documentation of your service as an example of what the client gets out of this service. They don't get assurance that their work is going to look perfect and brand new at the end. Instead, they get assurance that they are going to have a report that documents exactly what has happened during the treatment. They'll have a report that really does explain or they will have the peace of mind or the information to go back to their insurance company, whatever the case may be, that's the thing that you can provide regardless of what the outcome of a treatment is. And that's what you should have in your terms and conditions as a practicing, you know, interventive conservator. Um, and the other pro tip is look at the construction sector and the health and safety risk assessor practices because their terms and conditions are actually quite similar to what uh, even archaeologists, it's very similar to what we require. It says, you know, I'm, you know, especially for quantity surveyors or risk, health and safety risk assessors, they go around the building and they say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Suggestion, 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 strongly recommend, not so strongly recommend, et cetera, into a report. And then at times, some of those services can also include fixing those issues but they don't promise anything. Their promise is we're going to educate you on the condition of what your home or your building or whatever it is, is. And that's something that I think reflects very well on conservation because it's not so much about what you can do for them, it's what you're educating them of, is to let them know the condition of their objects, their artwork, et cetera. So that's a really good sector to actually look at. Um, so let's move on to the next section, which is Terms and conditions. Do I really need them? Yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> you absolutely do. Um, it's not, you know, required. It's not legally required for a business to have terms and conditions because it entirely benefits you as the business owner. To give an example, there, I, I can't even think of a business that doesn't have terms and conditions. And that goes all the way from lawyers who have 800 page terms and conditions with little highlighted sections that are the only bits that you can actually imbibe as, a, as the, you know, the reader and the signer of these terms and conditions to say, yes, I agree to this, to something as simple as going to a dry cleaner. Terms and conditions don't have to be outlined in triplicate and you know, more than one page and everything. Terms and in very fine writing, terms and conditions can actually be very simple. A lot of companies in service industries like dry cleaning, as, as this perfect example, put their terms and conditions in like three sentences at the end of their receipts. So when they say, please pick it up on this day, if you leave your jacket here or your shirts here for longer than two weeks, we have a right to dispose of them or we have a right to start charging you interest. All of that is technically terms and conditions. That is terms and conditions of practice. They make it very easily accessible to you. They just give it to you on your receipt. You take it home. If you didn't read it, that's on you. And that's why terms and conditions are so vital for conservators. We are dealing with very high value, very unique objects, whether it's high value, unique, or both. The whole concept of conservation is to preserve items that are very rare and of somewhat significance. Maybe if you're working with a thousand newspaper clippings, they may not all be of significance, but they are particular to that time, they, they are unique. And it's very important to know that, you know, protecting yourself in, this, in your terms and conditions to explain to people what you're going to do for them and what you're going to do for these objects and, and such are, it's vital, especially for insurance purposes. I mean, you never want to be caught out in a, in a way that somebody will sue you for all your worth as well as the worth of this million pound object, I don't know. So it's one of those things where you really do need to be aware that this is key. So part C, terms and conditions. Can I write them myself? Do I need a lawyer? No, you don't need a lawyer. You just have to make sure that your client has access to it. So I've seen a lot of people who put, and this is across different industries, put their terms and conditions on their website. 
uh, a lot of times you'll see with those little accept the terms and conditions of visiting my website, little those little buttons you have to click on every website now. You're not clicking the terms and conditions. That's long. I mean, it's you have to scroll through. It's just it's a very arduous process to do that. You're not going to sit there and read everything. It's the same as you get a, a new iPhone or a new Samsung or whatever. It's like, do you agree to the terms and conditions of that? Generally, people just click yes. Okay, but in clicking yes, in in acknowledging them, you acknowledge them. You don't have to have that actually. You know, in most cases, especially within a service, that's mainly for anything that has to do with online um, interaction, which has to do with data protection, which has to do with GDPR, which we will get to. So you just really need to have terms and conditions somewhere either publicly available or given by you by hand or digitally to the client themselves. And on the reference slides, there are a whole bunch of links to free service terms and condition outlines that you can download and tailor and make exactly exclusive for you that, that are legible, easy to read, very sensible, and are provided by kind of legal aid and public legal service professionals. <clears throat> One more thing, which was advised to me by a friend of mine who's a lawyer, is about exclusion clauses. Now, this is not always really that important for conservators, but I think it was just really important to have just in case. Um, and the example is that if you have an exclusion clause that is unusually wide, which will say, I don't know, you're I'm not liable or, you know, X is not liable as a conservator for any damage in underwater or something. I don't know, something very wide reaching, very vague, and you end up in that situation, you should highlight it. This is one of those things where this is the relevant information for that particular client or for all of your clients. It's really important for them to know. It's really important to highlight them. It's actually set legal precedent that you need to highlight exclusion clauses that are, or inclusion clauses that are particularly far reaching. Um, this is something where you may want to speak to a lawyer if you have a situation like this. You'll probably know if you do, but most people don't have that issue, especially you know emerging private conservators or pretty established private conservators. I, I really rarely doubt, I, I highly doubt that you'd ever need that. Um, we have the little red hand pointing to it. And uh, if you'd like to have a little laugh later, you should definitely look up where that red hand comes from because it's from the original precedent of this case where some judge deemed a contract so unfair that he was like, you need to, you need to point that out a bit better, literally with a pointer. So, so that's terms and conditions. Um, next up, we have contracts, invoices, and release forms. So this still harks back to the terms and conditions because your terms and conditions can be outlined in your contract, either at the end or throughout your contract, similar to like letting, letting service agreements and things like this. Um, there are pros and cons to it. Uh, I know that, I mean, I think with the having websites available for people, it's becoming more and more popular to have your terms and conditions available for download on your website so that people can have it someplace at home and review it and not just use it as scrap paper or something. Um, not that they would, terms and conditions are important. So the pros are that clients will always have the T's and C's available if you have it within your contract of service for whatever contract you're whatever service you're providing them and they won't be able to break any of the clauses of your terms and you know and conditions easily they won't be able to say hey you didn't say this and you'll say well if you read the terms and conditions which are attached to the contract of our agreement which you have a copy of and signed you know, you're, you're covering all bases that way um, it also provides clarity on payment terms services and your timeline so if they're like, well, what does that service mean? You say, ah, that's actually in the terms and conditions, which is clause, blah, 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 on this page. You can reference back to it very easily. And it condenses the document for clients to a certain extent. Because if you print out a long terms and conditions, if they, if they print out terms and conditions at home, and then they have your service contract on paper, and then they have to go back and forth between things, they can say, well, it wasn't easily accessible, even if it was. In this way, you can kind of staple them all together in hard copy or email it all together into one file and that's it, they've got it. The cons are that, you know, it can be kind of overwhelming for a client to have a contract and then terms and conditions, it feels like you're buying a house or something, you, you, they can get a bit overwhelmed. And I hear this a lot from conservators that clients get overwhelmed with the concept of terms and conditions and contracts and invoices. 
and not to go into a kind of rant about this, but if you were to meet that client when they were buying their car, would they have that same apprehension for proper documentation? No. They would say, I want more pages. I want to know that this car had this and that and this, and you're going to provide me with this service and that service. They like that kind of documentation in that industry. So I, I'm having a disconnect as to why it's too difficult to involve your clients with the terms and conditions and con, you know, physical contracts or digital contracts. It's important for them to see it legitimizes your business so that it's not some kind of shady cash in hand art world kind of thing. It makes, it gives it a legitimacy that's really important. Um, so, you know, while it can be overwhelming, there are other ways to go around that. You can make it so that you don't hand it to them. They can download it themselves from your website and your contract can just have a little bit at the end that says, this is all in accordance with the terms and conditions which are publicly available on my website or publicly available upon request or blah, 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 whatever term. And upon request is always a bit off. So it needs to be publicly available. Um, it's really just making sure that your client is able to read and be clear on everything. The other thing is that when it's condensed into one document, it can be confusing. A client may be kind of going back and forth being like, well, I'm overwhelmed because I'm confused by how much paper there is and everything. And that's, in that case, you say, okay, that's fine. Again, just separate it have it in two different places, give them access to it, but don't force it down their throat. So that's your kind of contracts, outlining your contracts and everything. It's, it's really a contract is just outlining a specific service your business can provide as, as according, as, excuse me, in accordance with your terms and conditions of business services. So that's all a contract is. Um, and I strongly recommend that you have some kind of way for clients to sign your contracts. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit as far as how documentation works when it comes to signatures, but that is key. Um, it can be a digital signature if you're really tech savvy. It can be a um, physical signature. It just has to be very, it has to be a confirmation in writing. It can even be an email, but it just has to be a confirmation somewhere in writing by hand or digitally that it says that the client knows what they're doing. They're of sound mind and happy to proceed. So onto a release form. What is it? It's an agreement acknowledging the receipt of goods. Why do I need them? As a conservator, why do I need a release form? This is maybe the most important thing after terms and conditions. You need a release form, even if, even without insurance in mind, even without anything else, because Clients that leave things in your care are leaving something of value in your care. And once it's with you and you don't have a, a written agreement about that, there are lots of really dodgy things that clients can say. Now, God forbid clients be them individuals. You know, it could be a granny down the road with her kids' photographs. It could be a corporate entity. It could be a financial institution it, with archives, it could be an educational institution, it could be any kind of client you could possibly think of needs to sign a release form when they give you something because you never know when things can go sour. And if they go sour, one of the first things they can say is, didn't I leave that other object with you? And you say, no, I, I only have this one. And it says, no, I know I left it with you. And that's just a misplacement of keys or whatever. It could, it could be something as simple as that. And then they say, I know I left that artwork with you. And suddenly it's gone from, I could have sworn I left it there, to you have it, to you stole it, to you won't give it back. It can escalate extremely quickly if you don't have that already in writing to say, you gave me X, Y, Z. That's all I have. You can bring more things. You can sign more forms to say you brought me more things. That's it. Um, additionally, it's good to have release forms that include a section where you ask for the value of the object because going back to that insurance thing, you can then tally how much you have in your studio and you can contact your insurer and say, hey, somebody's going to bring me something that actually puts me above my threshold. Can you extend it? A lot of times, if you're extending it within like, I think 5,000 pounds more, they can kind of do that for free. You just have to notify them. 
that's just the most important bit. And finally, I started again, contracts, just agree to the scope in writing, agree to the scope in writing, agree to the scope in writing, agree to the scope in writing. You must agree to the scope in writing. Um, verbal agreements, well, this is, this is the most beautiful bit about verbal agreements. Verbal agreements are, they do stand in a court of law. However, in this country and in most of the Western world and parts of Asia, and I think most of Africa, you can have a verbal agreement with somebody, but the moment that you use your phone or something to record a verbal agreement, especially with those sneaky kind of dodgy clients you may have, the moment that you record that verbal agreement and you bring that to a court of law, that verbal agreement is null and void because you recorded them without their knowledge. That is illegal. So then you're stuck with the idea of being in a court of law where you say apples and the other person says oranges. And that's a really difficult thing to prove without literally having a, a, a voice recording of it. And if you have a voice recording of it, that's illegal. So it's this endless catch 22 that really screws you over. So agree to it in writing. Nobody can renege on anything in writing. It's written, it is written. It's written by hand, digitally, in print, whatever you want, it's written. So it's there. So proceeding on from contracts, invoices, and release forms, we have professional documentation. Clarity is key. Now, let's say you have a client who has no idea what conservation is. They still call it restoration, or they think that you're just a, a little crafts person fixing things, not to say anything wrong with crafts people. I mean, people are very technically capable with these different crafts, but let's say they have no idea what you do, but they were told to come to you and they just you know, had to get something fixed and, or, or restored or conserved, whatever they need to do. They come to you for your service, they don't know really what you do, don't give them a 30 page report with graphs and spreadsheets and FTIR readings and everything like this. It's not, that's not your audience at that point. It's probably best to condense it. And if you really have done the research and you want to include it and you think it's actually really relevant, especially in the long term, if they sell it or they go to, you know, they need it for insurance, everything like that, write an abstract. Basically write a little paragraph to include in the body of the email that you send or that's at the beginning of the whole report that just says, so-and-so brought me this, I did this with it, I you know, treated it, and this is the documentation to show that I've assessed it, and then the report. Then you are in great standing with that client because they understand what you're doing. You suddenly have a better rapport because you've made this whole service relatable to them and in a way vital to them, more vital than it was before. Uh, the other thing with professional documentation is clear payment terms for clients and accountants. Again, we're back to this payment terms thing, which will come up again, but keep repeating the payment terms on every piece of documentation you have that's not a report. So anything that has to do with finances, terms and conditions, invoices, refunds, insurance, anything like that, anything that you need to reassure a client with that has to do with finance, repeat your payment terms, because then there's no excuse for them being late. And we'll get into late payments in a little bit. But finally, don't risk client edits. And I have this little thief going because I'm, I, I feel like I'm demonizing clients a lot. Most people who come to conservators are actually really nice and polite and friendly, but there's always that one person who ruins it for everybody else. And Client edits are one of the sneakiest ways that clients can really undermine all of your hard work. The key to that is, you know, it's both client edits, but also data protection, is if you restrict the editing permissions on your documentation, be it on the report or on the, you know, because people can say, oh, you actually didn't include that bit on your report. And you're like, yes, I did. And you look back and you're like, I swear I did. And your copy has it, but their copy doesn't. It's a little bit of tampering there. Um, there's also save read only copies for clients. When you save files on your computer, when you press save, there's a way in your save, whether it's in Microsoft Word or it's in, um, um, oh, I forget what it's called in Apple, but the, the Word document, Word processing features of any computer will have a section that says save read only copy. And that should be the one that you send out, especially if you're using Microsoft Word. 
When in doubt, save it as a PDF. Everything has that capability, even if you don't have Adobe. Even if your computer can't read that PDF later, you can save a document as a PDF. Um, and then if you're really technically savvy, you can go into online signatures so that clients can just like sign from home. You can even, to a certain extent, people can use their mouse to sign in that spot. Um, but that's again, a bit more technically savvy. Um, there are lots of tutorials online on how to do it. I didn't include that in the references, but um, if anybody's really particularly interested, you can get in touch with myself or with Holly and we'll you know, point you in the right direction. But yes, restrict editing permissions, vital. So moving on. Ooh, I've got a pot in my mic. All right, moving on. GDPR. What is it? Is it relevant to me? G GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It does what it says on the tin. Now, I've put this in this slide with all of its ridiculous bullet points with the European sign of GDPR in the background because this is quite a serious slide. Um, I personally didn't realize how serious it was for conservators until the past year and a half or so. Um, so I've included a link there where it says GDPR in their own words. That's a link that will be available at the end with the references um, that just leads to the organization's website, the kind of the you know governmental body, European Union body that explains what it means for businesses. Um, Essentially, it just means that any personal information provided by clients is to be protected from, you know, from data loss or identity theft. What does that mean? As a business, you need to safely store your client's information. So that's data. But what do they mean by data? They mean any information provided by a client that has to go electronically anywhere. Okay. Now that doesn't always mean phone calls because obviously it's really hot. I mean, unless somebody's wiretapping, it's going to be pretty difficult to, to you know, pre prevent yourself from having explicit conversations on the phone. But online, that counts for a lot of different things. So is it relevant to conservators? Yes, vitally. All of your clients will provide you with some sort of private information, be it their home address for invoicing, phone number, personal email addresses, um, hopefully not financial details, but possibly financial details, all of the, that information you need to be able to protect. That's so important. I mean, imagine if your plumber ended up accidentally releasing all of your data because he got hacked. And then you're like, well, now all my information is somewhere with some Russian hackers who have stolen my identity and stolen all my money because of my plumber. It's like, those are really... You know, it seems very distant, but that's now something that you as a business are liable for. So with that in mind, how do you protect digital data? Better digital business administration. One of the biggest things is turn off your company computer at night. If you use a personal computer for your company's business, I do that. Then the key is you need to password protect your computer and your phone anything that's used within your business, you need to preferably, I mean, if you really want to be, you know, top dog on this, you need to provide password protection for the documents that are used, produce those read only documents when you send them to people. Um, and a really interesting one that I didn't realize how relevant it was, but you really need to be aware of the protection provided within your service provider. So if you are, this, I mean, essentially this means make sure that you're connected to safe Wi-Fi. So don't finish off that report for, I don't know, Bill Gates. If you're writing a condition report for Bill Gates, don't finish that report using the Wi-Fi extra on the tube. You really need to make sure that you are protecting this data because if it ever is, you know, if it's ever susceptible to malware, it's probably already getting that malware attached to it probably already has somebody kind of prowling for interesting names and interesting people to steal identities of. A lot of people just do it for practice. I mean, I don't know if any of you have experienced identity theft. Um, I haven't personally, but I have witnessed it in friends and things, and it totally disarms you and to a certain extent ruins your life on a level that you would never think is possible. Because once that person has that one email password, they probably have your other email passwords. Once that person has that one, you know, 
phone number to log in to Facebook or something, they're in. And all of those different websites have come under fire because they all have links to financial information. You know, if your email is an, a Mac email, it can probably lead to your Apple store or your Google store data, which leads to your bank account. So this is why we as business, you know, as business owners and professionals need to make sure that we're doing our due diligence in accordance to GDPR to protect our clients. So that doesn't just mean, you know, make sure all of your websites have that accept or do not accept terms and conditions. That's not really relevant for us, but just the day-to-day -day protection of your client's data, vital. Um, so yeah, long story short, GDPR means you need to protect your client's information as you would your own. Because again, nobody wants to get just their whole life thrown into disarray from one dodgy service from someone. So that's essentially the, the, the key to GDPR. <clears throat> Finally, pricing and expensing. All these little circles floating about questions about pricing and expensing and how do we, you know, chase our clients and all of this. So let's start with how much should I charge? It's not my place to tell you. It's really nobody's place to tell you. It's up to you. But I would ask around. I think it's a totally relevant question to ask other conservators and you yourself will be able to kind of gauge, you know, this conservator has had 20 years of experience and has really big major galleries and private galleries and things as their clients versus this conservator has just graduated but is going private. They're very good, but you know, they're just starting out. There's gonna be a price discrepancy. And that's really, you know, that's, that's any business, that's any industry. Um, so that's something for you to kind of gauge. However, um, I would definitely also look into the international pricing because kind of on the scale of the, the Western world, um, the UK is one of the cheapest places to have conservation services done. Um, it's kind of beneficial for us because a lot of people will, you know, hopefully post Brexit, knock on, on wood, um, still want to come to the UK for art services in general. Um, and that's one of the reasons maybe why. Um, but you should also talk to Icon. I think they have already posted various things about how, what to price and advice and recommendations of starting prices, et cetera. But they, you know, that's a great first step. Um, speaking to our professional body. But in stars and in red and in bold and in, you know, all caps, I did say undercharging is undermining. This is a bit of a pep talk for you, viewer. You are a professional conservator. You went to school for this, you paid money to go to school for this, unless you got a scholarship, but you still went to school for it. You wrote dissertations on this whatever level of it, you then went and got experience in this. Your hands are your tools. You are not an, I, I hate using the word expert because nobody's an expert in life, but you are certainly a learned professional. If you suddenly then go pricing yourself at a very, very low rate in order to undercut everybody else in your field because you feel like people are going to go for the cheapest option, you're not doing your entire profession of service, really. It's very important to know kind of the general pricing that people put out and not to undercharge. Overcharging, you're going to price yourself out. That's pretty obvious. That's, I mean, you, you might be having a specific clientele that are able to pay for the services that you provide, but undercharging is undermining your abilities. It's undermining your ability, your experience, what you provide for the client and what you are you know, capable of. Um, and this is something I think that's rife within not just conservation, not just the art world, but in all, I guess what they would call professions within academia. There's a lot of this idea of if you had enough money to go to school for things, or if you had the knowledge or whatever to do this, you're doing it for the love of it. You're not doing it for money. And it's like, yes, of course. I mean, it's pretty rare to go into conservation unless you actually enjoy conservation. I mean, most people don't exactly know what it is immediately. But that doesn't mean that you're free. That doesn't mean that you don't have to pay rent. That doesn't mean you don't have to pay for materials for you to do this job, for tools, for healthcare so that you're in your best health to do the job. I mean, these are things that obviously you're not paying for healthcare here, but you get what I mean. It's kind of this, this issue of you, you can't just try and undercut 
everybody else and go at the lowest price because then somebody else is going to come in with the same method and undercut you still. And then you're going to have this constant issue of suddenly we're bottom of the barrel five or an hour or something like this. You know, it's not, it's just not worth thinking with that mindset. Set a price, um, preferably per hour or per service, however you want to do it. You can make the price list available so it's really clear to your clients so that you don't have to deal with that. Oh, I can't believe they cost that much. At least you have made it clear. And so then we get into the next bit of how do I explain pricing? Transparency. Keep it clear. Keep it simple. Um, I think most popularly people do an hourly rate or a rate per service. You don't have to provide that publicly, but tell the client before they get into the job. Don't just kind of name a price. You know, and the best bit is to name, if you have an hourly rate that's for those top biller, billing clients, when you have a client who you know can't afford it, that's when you can give them a discount. It looks very beneficial to them. They're like, oh, they normally charge this much, but they've given me a discount because they're aware of my you know, financial situation. How kind of them. That's, that's really good of them to do a deal. So more people love, people love a deal. Even if it's not really a deal, people love a deal. Excuse me. Um, actually, I'm going to take a moment really quickly for a drink of water. Um, another thing you can do with explaining the pricing is to give the client, you know, show them what they get. This goes back to that whole warranty thing. Don't give them a warranty. Tell them that they get a report. They get an assessment with condition assessment so they know the condition of the work. They get the service itself, the treatment. Um, and it gives them peace of mind. Um, I love to tell people that they can provide this to their insurance provider, whether it's their home insurance or, you know, if the artwork is, if it's an artwork or a, an object that requires insurance because it's such high value, you can then give it to the insurer. And then their insurance usually is very happy to receive things like this. They're like, oh, that's great. You know, maybe we'll give you a discount on your premium because you've gone through this effort on your own as a client to go and get this conservator to do work. So those things are really beneficial. They're not worth nothing. So that's definitely something that you can say is worth your price. And just accept the fact that people shop around. I mean, that's what a high street is for in the first place. If there are multiple businesses that sell dresses, that's competition, that's capitalism, that's unfortunately how it works. And that's where you need to show, you know, why you're unique and, you know, particularly important for this particular object. That does not mean immediately go into a specification. That doesn't mean I am the, old, I'm the world leading expert on intaglio prints from this particular era and everyone should come to me only. That's great, that's very helpful, but you know, there are other things to make yourself unique. You can be a more general person, you can be a pre preservation specialist, you can be a, a, you know, someone who they can call on simply for you know, general requests, general services, condition reporting only, things like this. But you can, you know, either the deal of, oh, 10 condition reports, you get 20% off or something if it's for big institutions, things like that. Um, you can say that your way of, I don't know, condition reporting is very particular. You can say you have a, I don't know if you have like a particularly good photographic setup so that you're really documenting things well. You know, whatever it is that your service provides other than your actual conservation services, highlight it. You know, if you can say, oh, I can go pick it up for you. I have a car or, oh, I can do large objects, whatever it is. That's something that you can say, well, you know, for my price, you're not going to really find many people who can do that. Or you're just not going to find many people who can do that at all, let alone for my price. If you've cornered the market, hey, if you've cornered the market. That's great. So next, the most important, how do I enforce payment? Terms and conditions, payment terms, invoicing, payment terms. If you include terms that a lot of people say threaten, it's not threatening. It's pretty common in most you know, contracts to say late payments accrue interest. It's just so easy. Late payments accrue interest. If you have a credit card and you pay late, you've accrued interest. That's the world. If you left your clothes at the dry cleaner, and you left it for three months, you're probably gonna have to pay more if they haven't thrown away your shirts. It's key to say that, you know, late payments accrue interest because the client, you know, they're gonna look at this, they're not gonna look at that. You know, they're gonna just say, oh yeah, I'll pay it, I'll pay it. 
when it comes to about 20 days on average, somebody will say, did I pay that thing? What does that say? Oh, I have 30 days. Ooh, but after 30 days, it's going to accrue 3% per day. That's a lot. I should pay this now. Especially, you know, accountants, corp, anybody who has an accountant who does their payments for things, corporate entities, universities, things like that, they will be looking for that payment term. That's key. They usually time it to that payment term. So that's why a lot of places won't pay you until the 29th day at the 23rd hour, they'll suddenly, it's in your bank. And you're like, why? Why do they take so long? Because of payment terms. 30 days is the normal turnaround. If you write that in and you give, you know, late payments accrue interest at the end, you're, you're going to probably nullify about 50% of those people who take a long time to pay. Um, and if they still don't pay, resend invoices past the payment due date. So after that first, I don't know, week of accruing interest, send them a new invoice with the new, you know, payment that they need to pay, including that interest and keep doing that until suddenly they look up and go, Whoa, I owe you double. You say, well, yeah, because it accrued interest as is stated in my invoice and in my terms and conditions done. So it, it's not, it's not calling them and threatening them or anything like that. It's, it's the fine print that people really do look for and know that once it's in writing, they've been told. And finally, should I include expenses? Yes, definitely. Um, expenses are common in all industries. If you work for Barclays Bank and they send you to a Barclays Bank in Surbiton, do, you, do they really expect you to pay for your train ticket to Surbiton? No, they expect you to pay for it and then expense it and get that money back because this was something that the business requested of you. So if you are doing a service that is outside of your city, which is usually kind of the accepted you know, distance or on the other side of your city, which in London is kind of an accepted distance, you can expense that, especially if that's a regular trip you'll be making. So if you are doing a contract for an institution that's, I don't know, in Greenwich, but you live in Kilburn, that's an expense that you can discuss with them and say, look, that's a significant cost for me to go all the way over there. You know, can we include the cost of that in my contract and my, in my um, kind of invoice? I, I, I think I should expense that to you. Food is not normally considered, but a lot of times you have to take the intern mindset of it, which is travel is included or food is included. It's very rarely both, but regardless, all of that you need to discuss with your client. Discuss it with your client. I mean, clients are, I find that a lot of people are afraid to talk to clients to such a degree because they're afraid that it'll scare them off. But I find that if you come at it, maybe it's because I'm very American, as you can tell, and I'm very smiley and things, but I, I, I've seen it happen in the UK. I've seen it happen internationally. If you are a professional who speaks with your client in a very relatable way, a lot of times that is what eases that kind of concern of the client saying, oh, what is all this documentation? What is all of this? What's all of that? If you kind of say, well, you know, it's similar to, if you went to the dry cleaners, this is kind of what happens. This is, this is a business. This is, I operate professionally like most businesses do. Uh, so I don't expect you to expect any less as the client. So discuss at length with your client Anything that you want to talk with them about, anything that you think they're confused about, definitely detail, pricing, expensing. Um, don't sit there and read the terms and conditions to them, but tell them where to find it. You know, if there's any clause that should be highlighted, be like, by the way, I should re you know, remind you of this. Um, repeat verbal agreements in emails and, and emails and in writing as much as possible. Um, and just, you know, transparency is key. It's just be clear. Clarity is, is beautiful. We live in 2019. <laughs> I think clients will definitely be interested in, in knowing that you are out there to help them. And it's good to have that rapport with a client as well, because it helps you very much in the long term. but that's for, um, for another day. So this is the list of references. Um, we've come to the end of all the questions. This is a list of references here. Um, I'll just really briefly go over it. Um, with insurers, I don't want to recommend any particular insurance firm. I think that's just 
unnecessary. You can Google it. If you can Google conservators insurance, um, just call each company up, call whoever they have as their, you know, broker to talk to and say, you know, what's, what's the deal with this insurance policy? Do you think it's relevant for me? You know, I do this particular type of conservation, really just lay it out on the line with them because that is your confidant. You know, insurers are at times more important than lawyers. <laughs> so it's very good to have that all clear with them and, you know, ask them to explain stuff. They're, they're happy to. Uh, legal document samples. Um, template lab is the one that I included because it has 40 different service, uh, service versions of terms and conditions. So for service industry, terms and conditions that you can then tailor. But if you just Google terms and conditions template service or service terms and conditions template or any amalgamation of those words, you will be able to find terms and conditions that you generally digitally can input through their website, like your terms, what your business does, how long you've been in business, what the business is, et cetera. And then you can just have, you can download it, it has your terms and conditions. And in most cases, these are free. You can also contact gov.uk. They have like an enterprise branch that's really useful. And also, um, what are they called? Legal Aid. Even Job Center Plus to a certain extent for entrepreneurial, like their entrepreneurial department should be able to help with terms and conditions. Um, so financial document templates, you've got service contract templates, which are pretty lengthy. You can just condense it as necessary, but they in a way include the terms and conditions as well. So that's a nice basis to start with. So we've got Rocket Lawyer, Wonder Legal, Law Depot, all of those different firms are, um, you know, their website online firms that help people with everything from, uh, you know, online rental agreements to service contracts for websites that provide services, which is also really interesting to look at, um, et cetera, et cetera. There's also consignment note template examples, artwork release form template, template examples. Um, the difference between the two, artwork release form is when a client releases something into your care, um, whether it's on site or not. And a consignment is when it's released into your care on your premises. So artwork release form would be for everything. That's to say, you know, maybe you don't know what service you're going to provide them, but you know, this is, this is to say that I am now interacting with this object, even if it's at your home. It's a release form to handle things essentially. Whereas a consignment note is you're leaving this with me. Um, and then more release form examples. Um, tax advice goes into a lot more things, but I thought it'd be useful to have, um, to link this for sole trader versus an LTD. Very, very briefly, um, being a sole trader is to be, uh, you know, private practice conservator without a business. So you're just an independent sole, you know, individual working. That means you can contract to other businesses, um, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that you can't as an LTD, but the thing about being a sole trader is that, let's say somebody releases something into your care, uh, it gets lost or something happens to it, you are liable to the extent of your personal finances, which for a lot of sole traders is not relevant because it's not you know, being handled to that extent. But with conservation, there is quite a fine line. So it's pretty important to know if you need to be a sole trader versus if you want to be an LTD, which means a limited company, which means a limited liability company. That's not to say you don't still need insurance, but this being a limited company makes you an entity that is limited to whatever is the financials within that entity. So I don't know, for example, Ashley Brown Incorporate means that if you sue Ashley Brown Incorporated, I am not being sued. Ashley Brown Incorporated is being sued. So it's quite a, it's a nice one for conservators. Um, I strongly recommend it. It means funnier tax things. It means probably investing in an accountant, but it can be very useful in the long run, especially if you're dealing with very high value things. Um, then we have the VAT scheme, which is also really useful, which is that if you are a limited company, but you're not making extreme amounts of money, you can use the VAT scheme as a way to make yourself exempt from VAT from having to pay VAT back to the government for up to, I don't want to quote, I can't remember what exactly the number is, but it's all outlined there. That's through gov.uk. <clears throat> There's more information on being a sole trader. There's more information on being a limited company. 
And then there is the contact information for HMRC. It's vital as an individual, as a conservator, as a, a person living in the UK. Save that. Save that. It's very, very important. Once this is publicly available to you, definitely save it. Um, and then reporting software, because uh, we did have some questions about how best to streamline your, not reports as in your conservation reports, but financial reports, invoicing, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, Captera has, is a financial kind of web comparison service. It's a free service. They have a comparison document that's linked there with all the different types of software that you can use. Really, really helpful. Um, the most famous one is QuickBooks, internationally recognized, definitely very useful. It updates every year with new tax law for your country. Very helpful. You can invoice with Quick, QuickBooks as well. Um, I believe if you get like certain extensions, you can even send contracts with QuickBooks, which is really useful. You know, you can kind of outline a contract of service and send that on, but that's, you know, again, not exactly in my remit. And then Harvest is another one that's free that within one business, you're able to send contracts, send invoices and document your time, which QuickBooks has as an aspect, but Harvest is really good at, excuse me, as well. You can document how long you've been working at things and you can do it with an app on your phone. So you can basically, and QuickBooks has this app. Most software does have this app. Um, I just put those two as like the top two links through Captera, but definitely go and look at the comparisons because let's say you're doing an hourly rate based job, turn on the timer, see if you exceed it. It immediately calculates how much those, that per hour is, and it gives you with the VAT. So that's pretty nice. Then there's the Money Supermarket link for um, different uh, small business banking with, uh, services, which is really, really vital because whether you're a sole trader or a limited company, it's really good to just have a business account to separate your finances, goes without saying. Um, then there's that link for GDPR again. Um, and finally, an article, which is things I learned in my first year as a conservator, which is from Icon. And I found that really useful as a kind of additional link for information. If you're an emerging conservator like myself, I think it's really, it's really helpful to kind of gauge from just the conservation practice side of things what to do in professional development. Um, so with that in mind, please do make sure that you check in on the poll and... Um, we're open to other questions. Thank you very much. Um, Holly, if you'd like to join <laughs> <in>. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Thanks, that was really, um, really interesting. Um, I've got a question for you okay. while people are thinking about theirs. Um, and something maybe that you didn't mention um, uh, is like deposits and asking for deposits in advance of works and I don't know like what your opinion is on them and whether or not um, you think that might be a useful way to get around tr helping to secure payments for for works and things like that. Um, yes, I think deposits are again this is in that whole um, personal opinions kind of section now but I would definitely say that the, um, the deposit say the deposit scheme as though it's a rental agreement, but the deposit scheme is actually really useful. Um, I try to limit it though to works that, like any work that I do that's like over, I think a thousand pounds, mm. because sometimes it can get really nitpicky if you're asking for a 50% deposit every time, or sometimes some people ask for full payment, especially in cases where you require additional materials. So, so if you're doing, I mean, and from the paper perspective, if you're doing a remounting project and you need boards or something and you don't have them, that's something that's an expense that you have to charge the client. So that's when you would be like, well, actually it would be beneficial if you just paid 50% upfront for the job. Also, um, yeah, most, most things I would say it's pretty good to do the deposit scheme, but I wouldn't, I mean, people have different relationships with different clients. So that's, one thing that I know can be of issue is when some clients will pay 50%, but then some other ones you trust to pay in a timely manner. It can become a bit funny if anybody finds out that that person has to pay, you know, when the job is done, whereas they have to be paid 50%. So whatever policy you take, either keep it very discreet or try and keep it, you know, consistent. Yeah, yeah. 
that makes mm. complete sense. <laughs> yeah. um, I was also wondering about like, um, thinking about how a lot of people now keep documentation and all, lots of all kinds of other things to do around their life, like photos and things in, in cloud storage. And whether when you were kind of looking into this, if you came across any kind of things about how safe that is and whether it's whether we should be keeping things on like Google Drive or on Dropbox or other kinds of cloud storage. So Google Drive and Dropbox are actually two of the most secure. I mean, Google is a vault in a vault in a vault. The way that they code is amazing and how they protect your Google Drive information is incredible. And the best bit is, is generally speaking, Google and I mean, Dropbox doesn't really do this, but Google obviously has very far reaching talents as far as what their data collection can do. But in most cases, it's just about getting you to buy stuff. So <laughs> their marketing is not ployed for like, they're, they're not trying, they're not getting hacked very often. They're essentially using whatever information that you input to them towards tailoring Google to you, um, which sounds a bit weird and big brothery, but it's not actually that bad. It's kind of like if they see you buying a lot of conservation materials and they'll start putting conservation material provider ads, you know, so they're not actually looking to look at the private information that you've got stored on Google Drive. However, that's because they're a major company. Same with uh, Dropbox, same with um, even like transfer, what's the transfer, we transfer, things like that. Those are huge conglomerates that when they have a data break, a data breach, you'll hear about it. Mm. And that's when you can be like, oh no, <laughs> it's like, I need to contact my clients and let them know. It's usually like, I mean, Microsoft Cloud Storage is like OneDrive is okay. Um, I've heard of issues that people have, particularly in America, with that. Um, but it's mainly, it's, it's other stuff. It's mainly the Wi-Fi issue. Like if you're on 4G, but like for, okay, so just using myself as an example, I'm cheap. I use PlusNet. So when I have stuff at home, I generally try to, I like have a password protected section on my computer for my professional documents and things because I use my personal computer for work. So with that in mind, I like password protect things and I try to make sure that like, I never connect my phone's 4G to my um, computer. But additionally, I try as best as possible not to open any of those documents because a lot of times the phishing and, and hacking software is just people having your, your screen right now as you see it open. So then if you open like super top secret document, then they'll be like, oh, <laughs> I should probably take a look at that guy's stuff. <laughs> so that's, that's usually what, hacking means in this kind of sense so you know and i know <coughs> i mentioned the plus net thing because i know plus net has had data breaches before i use them for my home internet because i'm cheap and they're very affordable but you know i certainly don't trust them to that extent whereas you know and on the same level as like if i'm on the tube and i'm using wi-fi extra i'm not going to open a secure document mm. so that makes sense. So we've had a question come in through the chat. I, hopefully everyone can also access, there's like a Q and A bar um, that they should be able to see in order to ask questions, but but um, the chat is also fine if you wanna ask questions through that. So the, the question, I'm not sure if you can see it, Ashley, is um, can you give us any tips in relation with pensions? Ah, okay. Um, no, that's actually really important. Um, I'm going to write that one down and get back to you. Um, I know that, so I kind of go based off of the American standard for pensions, which is you got to do it yourself. Um, in America, we have things called Roth IRA, which people use. It's not great. Um, well, it's, it's pretty great if you're a private, you know, professional, but it's not like, um, you know, it's, it's you managing it. It has to do with the fluctuation of whatever stocks you've invested in. Frozen. I think she was getting ISA. Um, but that's not helpful at all, I know. Um, that's something I would actually, I, I don't even think I'd be comfortable answering in another session. I think that's something that as an individual professional, you should probably speak to job center 
they help with that kind of thing significantly. Um, and they are really good at advising who to speak to, where to go, um, what your bank can provide as well. Maybe speak to your bank and say, I'm an independent. Oh, oh gosh. Oh no. Oh no. Sorry guys. Oh, up there. <laughs> Standard. <laughs> yeah, of course it's going to do course. it now. <laughs> it's right at the end. Auto update. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. Um, let me go back to the chat. Okay, back to, back to that. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't feel comfortable answering the pension question, but I would speak to job center, speak to your bank, explain your situation as a, as a sole trader or a, you know, limited company. Um, but I'm sure that this is handled by lots of different sole traders and, and limited companies otherwise. So that's probably yeah. an answer to the question. It might just need to be something you shop around for and, you know, mm. find a private pension provider. Um, but yeah, that sounds like it's something that um, your bank or your or job center would be able to help with. Yeah, whatever it is, it's just good to do. I mean, I just know from America, it's good to have a high interest rate if you do it as an ISA. So like slow growing, high interest rate ISA. Or um, if it's like an official pension pension, there are different companies that can provide it to sole individuals, but you really do have to be a stickler for what they outline so mm. thank you mm -hmm. does um does anyone else have any questions at this point um again you can use the chat or the q a bar hopefully yes <laughs> anyone um, <laughs> um i'm not gonna obviously i can't answer the poll myself but I would definitely say, um, I mean, those poll questions, are, if, you, if you have something else that you'd like to have hosted, just let me know, because you, I mean, you can email us and say you have something else you'd like. But, ooh, another question. Um, hello, Daniela. So as a conservator, just starting out, other conservators, sometimes assume that recent grads are willing to, yes, yes. So Daniela's question is a very good question, not just for conservators, but for people across different industries. Do you want to just repeat it all the way to the end so that- Yeah, I'm going to, I think it's, so as a conservator just starting out, other private conservators sometimes assume that recent grads are willing to volunteer a lot of the time. So the question I have is how do I ask that conservator if they plan on paying me for my assistance or if they haven't mentioned it, should I wait for them to mention it? So- that's a really good question. I'll type the answer later. I'll just answer it verbally for now. Um, yes, this is again back to the clarity issue and this is back to the payment terms issue. Talk to them, say, you know, I'm a recent graduate. However, I have graduated. I'm not a student and therefore not an intern. Um, you approached me with this job as a job, not as a voluntary position. Um, and, and just ask, just say, you know, what would you be happy with, you know, whatever starting salary that you think is appropriate. Again, ask around, um, especially for just starting out, I would definitely speak to people as far as what a starting salary is in other industries that have graduate students entering it. So whether it's, you know, graduate finance might be a bit extreme, but there's also, um, you know, other industries, tons of other industries, you know, emerging architects, things like that. They don't volunteer their time. They, they charge a salary. They charge an hourly rate. Um, it's a lower hourly rate than everybody else, but this is that whole gradient of pay. So that's why it's really important to, to discuss it with them. And I think it's really kind of unacceptable for, it's one thing, I mean, it's, it's not a good thing to not pay interns, but it's one thing to not pay an intern who is established as an intern Whereas you're contracting for a private conservator and you, you know, it's, it's just not, it's just not on. You should definitely ask for, for payment or not ask, but certainly discuss it. Don't feel afraid to discuss it. It's something that's, you know, it's, it's your livelihood. You should definitely ask. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, and don't, don't wait for them to mention it, but don't steam barrel in like, how much are you going to pay me? You know, just build a rapport read read what the the vibe is and see what when's the right time to ask but definitely before you start the work 
Um, another anonymous attendee is, they said, thank you, Ashley, very interesting. Thank you. Um, sound advice, thank you. I noticed this is being recorded. Can we listen to the webinar again? I believe the answer is yes. Yeah, um, so we're gonna, um, we are recording it, and I think first it will go onto the um, icon website, the book and paper group page um, behind a login wall. So essentially, you'll need to be an icon member to access it for three months, and then after that, it will become publicly available to anyone who wants to see it. Um, so that will be from the time that um, we're able to kind of process the re recording and get it put onto the website. But all of that will be announced either through iConnect or through our social media platform. So you can kind of keep up with it there if you want to um, access the webinar afterwards. But all of the references, uh, documents and links that Ashley put in the presentation, we will email out to all of you guys who've attended. Um, so you'll be able to access those sooner. But in terms of like watching the the webinar then you'll either be able to watch it sort of immediately if you're an icon member or after three months if you're not yes and then um, sorry there are two other questions i know we have five minutes here um just as a follow-up to the uh well three questions now one follow-up question for the um pension the pension information mm. um somebody's responded and again back to the disclaimer, don't hold us to this and don't hold this person to this, but they've said definitely all people should have a pension. The sooner you start saving, the better, and the way to go is probably an SIPP, which I need to research. Thank you very much, Celia. On another note, the other HMRC website, gov.uk, is also very help, very useful for simple guidelines on things like that, what information should be included on an invoice. Yes, gov.uk is a bit difficult to navigate since it's kind of revamped, but really, really useful for this information. And the best way to navigate that website is to just go into the search bar and search the relevant words. That's, that's how they designed it. They basically designed it without any kind of rhyme or reason as far as the, the breakdown of the site, because sometimes things will be hidden in different articles, et cetera, et cetera. But if you search it, everything will come up and it's really helpful. Um, then there was another one that said, it would be great to have a full session on GDPR. Oh my God. Um, I consider myself pretty tech savvy, but this is an issue I feel very hazy on. Perhaps a live demo on how you would password protect everything. Oh, okay. Um, what to do if you think you've been hacked or if there's any sort of data breach. Okay, so I can answer that question right now. If you think you've been hacked or anything, call your bank, call Google or like cancel your emails, basically. Just, just put a stop on everything. Um, but definitely call your bank first. If you think there's been a data breach of your clients, try and as much as you can figure out who, like who specifically may have been targeted, contact your insurance immediately and explain what's happened because they have protocols for this nowadays, and then contact the client. This is not something you wanna hide. This is something that happens to everyone everywhere all the time. This is really, really important and it's important to nip it in the bud as soon as it happens it's one of those things where if you see a fire you don't just sit there and wait for the whole building to burn down you have to respond quickly um so yes i would definitely say call your insurance provider call if it's a massive data breach if it's one of those things where your client's like i've been robbed and they said the source came from you that's one of those ones where you call the police to you know they they also handle things um that have to do with gdpr and data breach but definitely insurance and definitely cancel your email accounts, just put a hold on everything. Um, there's a couple more questions that have come out a bit last minute here. I'm gonna have to, I'm really sorry guys. Basically, this is my first time kind of using Keynote and it's acting really weird. So I have to zoom out of the, the full chat to then go over here like this and see what's going on. So apologies about that. I think that's but, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, how much do I charge as an hourly rate for my service? Can I give a rough idea of how much a treatment will cost on average? I don't feel comfortable disclosing that um, simply because, again, it's a big range. Uh, it's available on my website. I'll put it like that. And my website is www.theconservators.org um, as an organization. And you can look it on the website, but I, it's not really relevant to know what specifically mine is. Um, especially in such a public kind of forum that can be recorded and saved for the future. Um, Cause who knows my rates might go up, they might go down. And if this is the permanent place to see it, it's a bit of a, an iffy place to, to leave it. Um, but with that in mind, I will say that 
I know that prices do vary significantly in the UK. Um, I've seen everything from 25 pounds an hour to 400 pounds an hour. So this is why I kind of mentioned it as like a ask around. We probably should need to have more of an open forum within our own profession, not as open as this, but within our profession about this because it's really, um, it's, it's, it's something we should all talk about. Um, another one that's come up is how did I begin in private practice? Is it something I did alongside being a public, um, an, an employee for an institution? Where did you begin to get this client base? Thanks, that's been super interesting. Um, oh, and GDPR, same person has also said, GDPR covers physical copies of information too, yes. That means put it in a lockable file system or drawer or keep it in a safe place where nobody can access it physically. GDPR is any type of data, digital, hard copy. Put it someplace safe. Thank you very much for that, Victoria. That's really important. Um, so back to how I started in, oh, sorry, before I go into that. Um, this is another person uh, has said in the chat, you also need to contact the information commissioner's office if you have a data breach. Thank you. Yes, that is the one thing I was forgetting. Thank you very much for that one. Um, you should be registered with an ICO if you keep or process personal information. Um, I know that that's something that a lot of people are really slow to get behind. I haven't completely registered with the ICO, um, but it is very, it, the more we are all kind of connected into that, the more efficient that they can be as a body that, you know, govern them. Um, yes, it is a legal obligation now. Yes, indeed. Um, so back to the, how I began in private practice, I worked in institutions and then essentially took on work alongside being an employee of an institution. Um, I know some institutions are funny about that. They're very particular about how, um, you know, you spend kind of your time out of work if it conflicts directly with the institution's practices. Um, but that's something you can talk to your HR team about if you work for a, pub, a um, public institution. Um, and then of course it's even if you're, if you work in a private conservation practice and you want to do private work as well, it's, that's a bit of a, you know, conflict of interest. So that's something to definitely reconsider. But I think um, the client base is something that I would love to talk about within advertising and marketing because it's a lot of just going around, like get a business card, give it out. <laughs> that's all it is it's get business cards made hand them out like confetti to any place that has art or archival material or whatever your particular field is if you do sculpture go to places with sculpture if you do paintings go to places with paintings and think about where paintings exist they don't just exist in museums and they don't just exist in private collectors homes they exist in like you know banks Banks have a huge private collection. Deutsche Bank has one of the largest, I think the largest private art collection of a corporate banking body. And it was entirely made not for them to just collect art and, you know, lord over it as an, as an asset, because it is an asset. It was actually for the enjoyment of their staff. They wanted to beautify their offices and they thought, well, let's actually do this properly. We are a bank. We should invest in this. And they did. So for the past 40 years or so, they have an, amassed an incredible international collection. That's a place of paintings. Send them a business card. You know, things like that. Like, this is how you build a client base. Um, and it's every, what, everything from, you know, giving coupons to, to people for deals on personal photographs, et cetera. You know, it's to, to, to then corporate entities and private individuals and billionaires, if you'd like. <laughs> but um, it's just getting your face out there. So that's something I can talk about at length another time, but I think it's definitely not being a bit shy about it. You, if you're going to start your own business, every industry that has its own business start independently, they have to put themselves out there. So great. Um, yes. Great. Um, I was just going to say, I, to, to stress Nicholas's um, point about the ICO being a legal obligation. It is a legal obligation. Um, I, Need to get on that myself um, but and it's a it's a very important thing to try and register and get everything collated together so thank you Nicholas for that one mm -hmm. great excellent okay well we've kind of come to the end of the time 
allocated for the webinar. So I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's attended and asked such interesting questions and also suggestions for, for future things. We'll definitely, um, the poll looks quite clearly like advertising and marketing is, is the way to go. So um, we'll sort of <laughs> put it on, on that one. Um, and thank you so much to Ashley for putting this together and for giving your time to, to yeah, to really highlight um, there's so much out there, so much information, um, so many things to kind of get your head around when you're getting into private practice. And it's really great to have so many like now areas that you could look into it a bit more and, and um, references to follow up and things like that. So it's been really, it's been really great for that. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs>